Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, I would like to welcome you to the third day plenary session of the status of global soil biodiversity in the 2021 Global Symposium of Soil Biodiversity. Uh, it is a great honor to be here with you today. My name is Dr. Monica Farfin. I am the Executive Director of the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, headquartered here in Colorado, USA. Um, during this webinar session, we will be listening to five presentations of 10 minutes each. Um, I would kindly remind the presenters uh, to keep it to a 10 minute presentation so that we can have time for questions and answers at the end. Um, at nine minutes, if it's okay with you, I will intervene and let you know that you have one minute left. Um, and it is important that we keep to that 10 minutes. Uh, attendees, for the question and answer session, please use the chat to post your questions and um, include at the beginning, please, uh, your name of the, or the name of the presenter to who you want this question addressed. Um, and we will choose a few of these questions to be answered live. Um, unfortunately, we will not be able to get to everyone's questions, um, but the rest will be answered via chat. Um, let's see. So without further ado, um, I would now like to give the floor to Ms. Rosa Cuervas Corona of the Global Soil Partnership. And she is going to be talking about um, the recent report that has come out, the status of soil biodiversity. Um, Rosa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. I will share my screen now. Um, can I share my screen, please? Okay, could you see now? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Um, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, distinguished guests. Um, I will talk about um, the huge effort made uh, by around uh, 300 uh, soil scientists um, translated in a global uh, report uh, about the status of knowledge uh, of soil uh, biodiversity and uh, how this knowledge can contribute to uh, the current global uh, challenges. As we know, we already identified uh, more than one uh, million species from the uh, eight um, million. And also there's a huge potential to discover um, more species in terrestrial and marine ecosystems and soils are not the exception. And only one species dominates and is transforming uh, our planet, uh, the earth and its um, um, dynamics. Um, um, considering the story of uh, the universe, uh, 3.8 uh, billion years ago, everything starts in, in, in Earth. I mean, um, uh, life starts in Earth and uh, took uh, this time, uh, almost 4 billion years, uh, to uh, evolution, co-evolution, adaptation, uh, specialization. Um, um, for the human being to exist and 70,000 uh, um, 70, years ago, uh, human beings start constructing these complex uh, structures called uh, cultures and with that agricultural activities. And after that, um, 
economic and other uh, kind of activities. Uh, soil, as you know, uh, it's a valuable uh, natural capital, one of the most important, uh, and it's capable of provide uh, key essential uh, uh, functions and ecosystem services that allow uh, life on Earth, basically. And as you can see uh, here in this nice uh, image, um, unfortunately, 30% uh, of our soils are degraded due uh, to um, different um, uh, activities. Um, related with industry, uh, agricultural activities, and also land use, uh, producing, um, of course, degradation of soils, uh, compaction, salinization, pollution, and of course, the loss of soil biodiversity, and also the loss of the complexity of the food webs. Uh, considering this, uh, FAO, uh, GSP, uh, in collaboration with uh, the CVD and the GSBI, uh, prepared this and coordinate uh, this important uh, report, the global report, uh, in order to contribute to the know-how to monitor, manage, and use in a sustainable way uh, soil biodiversity. Uh, a healthy soil is not only uh, capable to provide essential ecosystem services, also uh, contribute to the achievement of the SDGs, uh, the IG targets, and also human well-being. Uh, what is soil biodiversity then? Uh, we define, we have here the definition, I will not read, but uh, it's a variety of life, including uh, microorganisms, micro, uh, meso, and macrofauna from microhabitats to landscape. And I will show you very fast this, um, uh, splendid uh, creatures that uh, are part of beautiful uh, allow uh, life uh, on earth. Uh, what do we know about soil biodiversity? Uh, uh, as, as you well know, um, we identified already uh, a thousand of species in different groups. Uh, the main driving force of the a uh, high soil biodiversity is due to the body size fraction, the functional diversification and the variety of ecological niches uh, from single cells and nanometers to landscapes. Uh, oh, it's important to mention also that the, uh, um, 25% of the biodiversity is related to soils and soils contains most diverse terrestrial community, communities on the planet. And also that we cannot split above and below ground because the systems are open, of course, and flows matters and energy through them. And something that happens below affects above and vice versa, as you can see here in this image. Um, uh, why uh, soil biodiversity is important? Okay, because uh, we can, for example, for um, uh, agricultural sector, we can use this as a, a clean biotechnology, biotechnology uh, using ino inoculants, specific uh, bacteria, for example, and fixing bacteria in order to increase uh, productivity, reduce leaching and therefore uh, pollution and also uh, reduce non-CO2 emissions. Uh, also, uh, regarding biological control, we can use uh, specific genes from a specific bacteria during genesis in order to um, uh, inoculate in plants, in this case, amatine uh, plants can, um, or the use of, of microorganisms as bacteria and fungi, uh, microscopic, microscopic fungi uh, can immobilize certain toxic compounds from soils. Uh, regarding um, um, degradation, for example, in, uh, soil uh, biodiagnosis and pioneer uh, plants. Uh, and use uh, uh, the best functioning uh, 
of uh, of the system uh, regarding a soil um, uh, no sorry regarding um, human health uh, um, the discovery of penicillin uh, has had major impacts on increasing human life expectancy you know and of course art um, is not uh, the exception as as we can see beauty inspires um, the, the problem or the issue is that our uh, diversity is in great danger caused uh, uh, due to 10 major threats and the cost of inaction will be uh, 50 billion euros per year. Uh, you can see here the 10 threats uh, related with deforestation, agricultural intensification, pollution, salinization, a nutrient imbalance, a compaction, fire, urbanization, sealing, among others. Um, uh, all of these uh, threats will affect uh, biodiversity in different uh, grades, but um, um, demeaning um, biodiversity um, habitats, no? also uh, decreasing uh, the complexity of the food webs, also um, for a specific uh, species uh, in balance and therefore inputs for uh, plant growth and uh, also for microbes uh, growth, uh, etc. And also will take deca decades in uh, to recover the, the uh, biodiversity. What are our uh, challenges? A few countries uh, that maintain uh, national soil information systems uh, include soil biodiversity and are related uh, in most of the cases to uh, developed uh, countries. Also, there's uh, a necessity to strengthen all uh, the knowledge in all soil groups. Uh, we need to recognize soil biodiversity in uh, the most global agendas. Uh, there's weak capacity to develop the adoption of uh, novel technologies and also there's a necessity uh, to invest in research uh, related to microbiome um, and also uh, there's a need to scale up bioremediation to address soil pollution. Um, as I mentioned already, um, the potentialities are huge uh, regarding food security, biological control, uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation, and also nutrition and human health. And uh, more than ever with this uh, pandemic uh, situations, uh, also for climate change adaptation and mitigation and uh, microorganisms are key for carbon sequestration. Uh, what are uh, our way forward? Uh, it's very important to mainstreaming soil biodiversity in the sustainable development agenda, as I mentioned, as a UN decade on ecosystem restoration, it's very important to develop standard protocols for assessing soil biodiversity in different scales. It's very important to establish soil information systems, but uh, including soil biodiversity as a key indicator of soil health. Also, it's very important to improve knowledge about uh, soil microbiome and also about uh, soil groups uh, that forming uh, soil biodiversity, not only microorganisms. Uh, it's very important to establish a global soil biodiversity uh, observatory, uh, observatory and also an initiative for sustainable management of soil biodiversity. And finally, I will leave saying that small actions can cause uh, big uh, changes. And as civil society, we can start uh, doing these uh, small actions. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Rosa, that was a wonderful synopsis of um, the report and the importance of soil biodiversity um, in the world and to humans. Um, thank you very much. I know we're going to have questions on this as we proceed. Um, I would next like to um, turn the floor over to Dr. Carlo Fada. Uh, uh, Dr. Fada is the Director for Biodiversity for Food and Agriculture Research at the Alliance of Biodiversity International and CIAT. 
Dr. Fada, are you ready? Yes. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody. Uh, let me share a presentation. I don't know, do you see it? We do, thank you. Thank you. So I, I think I will follow up on some critical aspect of Ro, uh, Rosa presentation. Uh, I think that, that it, it is important to understand a little bit better the interaction between above ground biodiversity and the below ground biodiversity. This seems to be separate word, but it's not, they're not really. They talk to each other and interact in very many ways. Just to, to be clear that I'm, I work on genetic diversity of crops, so my area of expertise is more on the above ground. And so we talk about how those interactions can potentially, although there are many uh, gaps, uh, but how those interactions can potentially uh, improve the sustainability and resilience of agro's ecosystem. I will go quickly uh, through it because I think all this has been already mentioned several times during the, during the conference, the symposium, but we all know what the challenges are. So there are malnutrition crises where people, two billion people are uh, suffering from micronutrient deficiencies, uh, and there is an increase of, of, of obesity. There is still 800 million people that uh, go to bed starving at the end of the day. There is a biodiversity crisis. We know that uh, a lot of, I mean, particularly for food and agriculture, uh, there are over 6,000 uh, 6, plant species that are known for that of which 200 make major contribution to food production, but only nine account for 66% of total crop production. So not much of the agrobiodiversity is used. We have the climate crisis, and, and that is also strongly related to unsustainable agricultural practices that combine together from farm to four contributes to about 30% of greenhouse gas emission. And again, the land degradation crisis where uh, the proportion of land which is degraded is about 25% in 2020, but it's said to increase if the current pattern of, of, uh, of land degradation continues and if unsustainable agricultural practices uh, continue to be used. Also considering that at the moment, agricultural production system is the larger agroecosystem on land because it's taking over other so, um, and, and I think all these four crises are interlinked. They all uh, link to the use of unsustainable practices. Rosa showed uh, nice pictures uh, about how this is, uh, how intensification of agriculture, monocropping uh, is, is causing uh, loss of soil biodiversity and is causing land degradation. And there is a big call for a change because of that. So for example, FAO, says that biodiversity for food and agriculture is indispensable to food security, sustainable development, and the supply of many vital ecosystem services. The CBD talks about transformations that need to be achieved in the production of good and services, especially food, and uh, uh, through the adoption of agricultural methods that can meet growing global demands by imposing fewer negative impacts on the environment, because this is the trick, you, we need to produce more food because population is growing, but with less impact on the environment. Uh, the World Economic Forum, so even the private sector is very much aware of it. There is no future for business as usual. They're reaching irreversible tipping points for nature and climate and over half of the global GDP is potentially threatened by nature loss. And again, agriculture is a major contributor to this nature loss. The IPES food, we need a fundamental different model of agriculture based on diversifying farm, biodiversity coming back, replacing chemical input, soil is of course very important for that. So we can see that the number of actors from civil society, the economic, the UN agencies are all calling for a change. And we know that there is, uh, uh, that, that, that soil are very important, uh, soil biodiversity is very important for ecosystem services in agriculture. Uh, because it improves soil fertility and this will be linked to more food production. It also contributes to crop, prote crop protection. Uh, before uh, uh, many years of, of work on, on, on soil biodiversity, it was thought that soil was just uh, bringing diseases, but now we know very well that soil can protect uh, plants and fr from diseases and pests. 
Uh, it mitigates climate change uh, by absorbing carbon, and it's also a reservoir for soil and water conservation. And it does this on a number of, of approaches. It was well explained by this paper on, function, on plant functional traits and soil and ecosystem services. And because we're talking about plant functional traits, this is where we go into the uh, what, what could be a good agenda for research uh, in the next future. So when we look at the, uh, at the, up, the, the above ground perspective, we, put, we know that a lot of crops have a huge amount of diversity. This is because uh, they were adapted over the past say 10,000 years in the beginning of agriculture to different environment. They were subjected to natural selection as well as, as, well as human selection. And so when we work on crops, there is a huge amount of uh, diversity that can be used, and yet much of the intensive agriculture today also only use one or few varieties. And what happens when we plant more varieties, as one can see from these graphs, is that the disease pressure decreases. So if you have one variety, that could be super resistant, and so you have no disease, but you are also facing a, a higher risk because you can also have very severe damage. And the more varieties you plant in your field, the damage actually get reduced. So we know that diversity alone brings a reduction of disease pressure, but is it really alone? We also know that planting different varieties together also not only improve the, the resistance to pests and diseases, but also improve yields. So in this experiment, we planted uh, four different varieties uh, in, uh, as, as mono, mono variety trial and then we plant them all together in one crop and there was no one single variety that would actually uh, beat the, the combination of the four when they are planted together. Now that of course would call for a different type of management of the crops but it's interesting that when you bring those varieties uh, together you have a better yield than any of the single lines. And also we know when we go down and how these varieties may interact and please don't look uh, at all the details of the graph of the graph and when we go down to uh, to the what happens in the in the below ground connection we have total root length for example these characters average the root length and there is a huge amount of diversity in there so the root structure of this genetic diversity when you bring them uh, of this, when you, when you bring them together, is, is also very broad. And, and one would assume that these roots would use the soil resources differently. So is there a possibility, is it, uh, is it possible that because when, when you plant different varieties in one plot, you have better pest and disease management, best, better control of pests and diseases, uh, better yield, is because you, you have different root systems that actually use the soil uh, biodiversity, the soil resources in the different way. And so they are more efficient overall to manage soil. And, 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 that could be, uh, and, and, and that could be a nice area because all this is done by people like me, for example, where who is looking at, 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 at uh, what happens to the crop. But any of the paper that I presented here is actually showing, uh, is actually showing what could be the, the, the possible explanation for all this? Is, is there something that links uh, what is happening in the above ground with the below ground? And the last point, because I was talking about the crisis and, and, and it was mentioned soils are pharmacy. So there, are, there is also soil and the nutrition crisis and soil are the foundation of nutrition. The plants get their nutrients, the minerals, et cetera, from, from the soils. And so the more they are available in the soil, and, and that can be favored, as, as it was explained earlier by the previous, by the previous speaker, by, by facilitating also the uptake of some of these uh, very important uh, micronutrients and minerals. So soil uh, would address, to sum up, would address all the crises that I presented at the beginning, from the land degradation, the climate change, uh, the productivity issue, but also the nutrition crisis. So, to conclude, we need to have a better understanding of the relationships between plant functional traits and agroecosystem processes and services. We still don't know enough. I work, I don't work with soil scientists to understand how my different root systems in my different wheat varieties interact with the soil. And we need also to understand better how functional diversity influence agroecosystem processes. 
and services. So from the genetic diversity, from crop rotation, from intercropping, so that we can design production system that have more diversity at this level and that have more effective crop rotation and intercropping. We heard uh, from the first year, from the first day of this symposium, how having more, more uh, crops in the rotation actually help uh, improving the biodiversity of the soil. So we need to take all these into account uh, in our research. And then of course, how we can uh, uh, have a better understanding on the how soil biodiversity can be managed to improve human nutrition. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fada. That was wonderful. Um, we have had many questions come in about your presentation and we will address some of those um, after our last speaker. We appreciate your, um, your presentation very much. Um, our next speaker uh, who I'd like to bring up is Mr. Dylan Warren Rafa. Um, Dylan currently works with the FAO um, and he is uh, currently pursuing his doctorate at the agrobiodiversity, in agrobiodiversity, excuse me, at Sanana School um, of Advanced Studies. Uh, Mr. Rafa, the floor is yours. Yes, Monica, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Yes, both. Great, fantastic. So thank you very much. And and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm really happy to, to be here and having this opportunity to share the work that they have, we have been doing in the last uh, year with my colleague uh, Jennifer Kenzier and Anne Bogdansky on the uh, effects and the impact of crop production practices on soil microbiome and on their implication for ecosystem health, for climate change, and for human uh, well-being. So um, let me start with a brief introduction. Um, we all know that the mind is facing multiple challenges. Uh, we know that uh, uh, we have to face challenges such as malnutrition, biodiversity loss, natural resource degradation, and all of this under the threatening um, pressure of uh, climate change. But what has emerged in the last let's say decade in the last years that we believe been very interesting is that those challenges are interdependent and hence we should not try to take them in isolation when we talk about interdependencies we for instance know that malnutrition is a fertile ground for non-communicable diseases or for instance that agricultural production can definitely play a role in food security, but also causes biodiversity losses and natural degradation. So when looking for um, alternative explanations to uh, understand the relationship between those challenges, we in FAO start to work, start to focus on the role of microbiome as a missing link. Why is that? Well, because when we focus on the agri-food systems, we, it's actually clear that the microbiome are, is quite different and also that interacts uh, along the agri-food agri system, as you can see. So it goes from the soil microbiome, which would be the focus of this presentation, uh, the animal microbiome, the plant, the aquatic, up to the food, until the human gut, uh, the human gut microbiome. So, as an informal uh, FAO uh, microbiome working group, we started to work on a series of review of those uh, microbiomes in order to um, actually investigate what evidences are there on the role of microbiome on ecosystem services, ecosystem functions, and human health. So let me briefly say that obviously this work is uh, very much interdisciplinary and the uh, frameworks like such as the One Health is uh, definitely of help, and also that this work is uh, very much linked to uh, at least those five uh, sustainable development goals. So overall, in, in the work we are carrying out uh, um, as a FAO microbiome working group, we, we certainly wanted to come up with studies, with reviews, which were quite, quite comprehensive on uh, uh, the soil microbiome 
on the microbiome in general. But the, the real aim is actually to build a process, a process that based on science, promote debates with the overarching goal of informing policy. And today um, I will just talk uh, about a few key message that emerged from the work we've been carried out on soil, where we actually explore the connections between corn production systems, the climate, uh, and the human health from the perspective of the soil uh, microbiome. So to this hand, we actually uh, use a pretty diversified methodology. For instance, we started with narrative literature review as a descriptive tool uh, of the role of soil microbiome on ecosystem services and climate change. We uh, also um, work on what is the effects of farming practices on soil microbiome. And then we also use the systematic literature review. Here, we wanted to focus more on the uh, interlinkages between practices, microbiome, and climate change or human health. When I say interlinkages, basically I mean if the farming practices change the soil microbiome in a way that the climate change or the human health is affected. Last but not the least, we carry out a series of focus groups. We put together microbiome experts from research, from industry, and from, from policies. The idea was to obviously discuss our findings, but also create a momentum, reach a consensus, and plant future uh, collective and very interdisciplinary work. But let me directly um, maybe jump into a few key messages of the review on soils. Um, firstly, we uh, highlighted that we found very strong evidences of the key role of soil microbiome uh, in providing a very wide set of ecosystem services and on mediating uh, biogeochemical cycle, cycles related to uh, climate change in terms of greenhouse gas emission and carbon storage. Despite that, we um, conclude that our current knowledge do not actually precisely allow us to predict how shifts in microbiome um, can affect the uh, release, for instance, of greenhouse gas emissions. Concerning practices, we found very detailed evidences of the effects of certain practices on the soil microbiome and uh, on the consequent effects of um, on soil uh, functionality on greenhouse gas emissions and carbon storage. I'm thinking, for instance, about the crop diversification strategies that uh, uh, Carlo Fada was referring for. In our work, and especially as a result of the, um, of the focus groups that we, we carry out, uh, we identified several opportunities and research needs. I'm not going into, into the detail now, but I mean, the report will be released in a month time or less, and there you can definitely find much more uh, detailed information. Uh, concerning the, um, the human health, we did not really uh, found clear evidence on direct links between soil microbiome and human health, but it's certain that the conceptual framework is there, and therefore uh, we agree that it is definitely worth it to continue to investigate on this, uh, on this topic. Last but, but not the least, uh, the uh, interdisciplinary nature of soil microbiome obviously calls for interdisciplinary collaboration, which are definitely critical in this, uh, um, on this topic. So, as a result of our work, we, work, we um, obviously identify that we have a huge diversity of genes and functions uh, in the soil microbiome. And we actually do not know that much. Um, it's striking all the time when I think that we know only about 1% uh, of soil biodiversity in general. So we know even less in terms of soil microbiome, but still we are statistically able to, to see uh, significant effects of those microbiomes. So you can imagine the, the magnitude of the opportunity that, that we are talking about. And actually the market seems quite uh, responsive on this. You can see this figure and it's absolutely clear that the private sector is also moving forward and this figure are actually expected to grow um, further in the next uh, in the next years. But 
Okay, from a practical point of view, now the question is, uh, what do we do with this information? How do we make those information viable uh, at agricultural scales, at farming scales as well? And what we notice is that we basically have two kinds of approaches. The first approach, which is uh, very much focused on practices, agricultural management in terms of fertilizer, tillage, uh, design, uh, the diversity of the ecosystems. A second approach is uh, um, very much linked to inoculates, basically adding microbes or adding substances which favors the uh, activity and met metabolism of microbes. And what we noticed in our, uh, uh, in our interaction with experts is that the debate gets very often polarized. People arguing that uh, we need more practices, people arguing more on products. The point that we really want to make here is that those approaches are not mutually exclusive and that uh, those approaches are rather extremely complementary and are both needed in order to really exploit the full potential of the uh, soil microbiome. Um, Mr. Rafa, you have one minute. Yes, thank you very much, Marina. That's actually my last slide. Um, and uh, so let me conclude with a couple of uh, recommendations for policies, which I want to stress emerged from our focus uh, groups and from the interaction we had with uh, uh, microbiome experts from academia, from uh, uh, policy and from private sector. First of all, those groups identified that policies should actually create an enabling environment for the use and enhancement of, uh, um, of the soil microbiome in agriculture. And this definitely entails uh, public support for research uh, as well as for business opportunities. We also need to raise awareness, so I'm very happy to be here today. Maybe we are kind of contributing to this, to this um, goal on the key role played by the soil microbiome. And then we definitely need a regulatory framework, an enabling, uh, also technical framework, which can promote farming practices, which can regulate products, um, and which recognize the value and foster the activity of soil microbiome uh, in agriculture. Last, um, let me say that during this process, um, we, uh, FAO was actually recognized as a really reliable intermediary, which was uh, kind of able to put together the scientific community with policymakers in order to bring tangible change to the food system through the soil microbiome. So with this, I thank you very much for, for your attention and uh, give back the floor to Monica. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Rafa. Um, we are going to go straight into our next speaker because we are running a little short on time right now. Um, Dr. Um, Alberto Orgazzi um, currently works uh, in, with the European Commission Joint Research Center. Um, he uh, is currently heading the Lucas Soil Biodiversity Survey, which is a large scale campaign supported by the European Commission. Um, and I will now turn the floor over to you, Dr. Orgazzi. If you could unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? I can. And see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Okay. okay, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, be with you and to present a bit what I'm, uh, what I'm doing. In the next 10 minutes or so, I'll be telling you something about uh, uh, large scale assessment on solid biodiversity, what we have and what we miss. So probably if you have attended uh, a soil biodiversity conference or workshop meeting, whatever, in the next few, in the past few years, you have seen a scientist starting the presentation like this. Soil biodiversity is very important, but unfortunately we don't know uh, much about, uh, about it. I used to start the, my presentation like that, but then I realized uh, wait, wait a second. This is not, this is not true. So we, I need to take a step back, uh, rewind, and start again my presentation. This is my first uh, slide. 
uh, for today. Soil biodiversity is very important, uh, of course. And uh, we have to say that thanks to the great efforts of many research um, uh, groups uh, from all over the planet, we know a lot of things about, uh, uh, about it. For instance, we know the function and services provided by uh, soil biodiversity, like uh, food the importance in agriculture, food production, also in climate regulation, as already mentioned, also for um, medicines discovery. Now it's quite a hot topic, this one. And soil biodiversity can be a very important uh, reservoir of uh, new antibiotics, for instance. We know also the factor that uh, factors that shape soil biodiversity, like the soil, uh, like the soil physical chemical properties, uh, like also climate, vegetation. Of course, we also know the threats, the risk that uh, affect soil biodiversity from the most generic one, like climate change, to the most specific, like soil erosion. And we also have a, a good insight on the distribution of soil uh, biodiversity. That was not the case uh, five years ago when, uh, we, uh, together, when the European Commission, together with the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, published the first ever Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas. Of course, being an atlas, we had to produce a global map of soil biodiversity. And I have to say that it was quite a challenge to do that because basically there were no, no data at uh, large scale. So at the end, we, we, we were able, as you see in the in my slide to produce the first map of soil biodiversity, but we use some unpublished data, proxy data like uh, microbial biomass, so not real um, biodiversity, um, biodiversity data. However, the Giatlas uh, had an important message. So they need to invest more, to um, invest, do more research on the distribution of soil biodiversity. And actually that's what happened over the last five years. Uh, now indeed we have so many um, maps, global maps of the distribution of different types of soil organisms uh, from um, uh, microbes like uh, bacteria, fungi, but also uh, nematodes, uh, earthworms, as you can see in, uh, uh, in, in, my, in, in my slide. So uh, one can argue that uh, now we know everything about, there is a lot of research going on. We know everything, many things about soil biodiversity, but I think that there is something that is still, uh, um, this is still missing. There is something that we don't know yet about soil biodiversity. What is missing is uh, uh, ad hoc cons uh, conservation policy, policy targeting soil, uh, um, Soil, soil biodiversity. Uh, one can say, but of course, we are already pro uh, protecting soil biodiversity while we uh, protect above ground uh, uh, biodiversity. At the same time, we are also protecting uh, soil. Um, that's not really true. Uh, thanks to the maps that I showed before, the, the new maps, we were able to see that there are uh, no overlap between hotspots uh, uh, of uh, above ground and below ground biodiversity. So if we are protecting um, above ground biodiversity, not always we are protecting also the life uh, in, uh, um, in the soil. So this means that the specific action to protect uh, soil biodiversity are, uh, uh, are needed. And from a scientific point of view, this means that basically we need a monitoring uh, plan schemes uh, on uh, soil, uh, soil biodiversity. Indeed, if you want to protect biodiversity, whatever uh, biodiversity, you need to uh, monitor, uh, uh, monitor soil, uh, biodiversity. Is that the case, for example, of large mammals like the panda? Uh, so we know uh, where the panda lives, uh, its habitat, we can monitor. Uh, if it changes, then we can, for example, reshape, reshape uh, national parks and boundaries of national park uh, uh, reserves uh, to, to better protect uh, this kind of uh, animal. This is not happening uh, for, um, for soil biodiversity. Uh, for instance, this is a fungus, Pleurotus nebrodensis, that is found, is known to be found only in, uh, um, in the northern part of Sicily, in Italy. However, there is not a monitoring plan on, on it and on, not even a specific policy conservation to protect this uh, these, uh, um, these organisms. So this demonstrates the importance to start developing large and small, also small scale, uh, like in Sicily, uh, uh, monitoring uh, scheme plans for uh, biodiversity. This will have a double advantages. Uh, 
Uh, one, from a research point of view, we will, we will be able to answer important questions like uh, extinction risk associated to soil biodiversity. So far, the research on this field basically was um, very, very limited. We know uh, a few about this, but if we are able to assess the risk, we are also able to uh, identify uh, possible species that are uh, endangered, so in risk of, uh, of extinction. And the other, from the other side, the monitoring will also allow to develop some indicators, specific indicators for soil biodiversity. That is a key element if we want that the soil biodiversity enter into the policy uh, arena. So uh, policy makers need uh, um, indicators to monitor the effect, the impact of their uh, um, decisions. Luckily, the situation is improving. Uh, there are many ongoing initiatives to start monitoring soil biodiversity, some at regional scale. Is that the case of the Lucas Soil Survey in, uh, in, in Europe? But there are also other initiatives in Africa, China, also in Australia, and probably also other initiatives that I'm not aware, uh, uh, aware of. Uh, let me just say a few things about uh, the, uh, Europe. Uh, I'm working for the European Commission, in, in, in particular in this uh, big survey at the European scale called the Lucas Soil Biodiversity Survey. We started three years ago uh, uh, in tw uh, 2018, uh, collecting about 1,000 uh, samples across Europe. We are now repeating the, the sampling. So it's, it's the idea is really to launch, uh, to have the first monitoring plan for uh, bio soil biodiversity in Europe. Of course, this will allow to contribute uh, to uh, research, but also to uh, policy, and in particular, the new European biodiversity strategy for 2030. All the data and uh, also the protocol that we are using for this uh, sampling and analysis of the uh, soil samples are available online, open access. You can easily access them uh, on our website, the European Soil Data Portal. Just Google Soil Data Europe, and the first uh, results will be uh, will give uh, will lead you to uh, lead you to um, to our uh, website where you can find all the uh, information. There are also, uh, of course, initiatives at more, at more global scale. It's like the case of the newborn, almost newborn uh, soil, uh, soil boin, which is the Soil Biodiversity Observation Network. As you, as you can see, there are uh, many actors involved from all over the, the, the planet. Uh, it's coordinated by the, by the IDIV in Germany, the German Center for Bi for biodiversity, and the idea is there is, is really to have a global uh, uh, scheme plan for uh, monitoring soil biodiversity. We already uh, propose some a list of possible indicators that can be uh, developed uh, using this uh, this network. Again, this is a, a open uh, network. You can easily join. Just uh, Google, uh, search soil born and register. You you'd be updated, and you can also actually contribute by collecting soil samples and helping uh, helping us. So uh, my last yeah one minute. You have yeah, one my, minute. Yeah, it's my last slide. Just to summarize. So as I said, we will need in the future the development of a large and small scale uh, monitoring scheme. Uh, it's important to um, find a, a trade-off in the scientific communities. There is a long debate on how is the best way to monitor soil biodiversity. I think it's also mine is a call to all scientists. We need to find an agreement. It's time to, uh, to move on. Probably there is not the best uh, soil biodiversity indicator, but if there are the, the alternative is not to enter in the policy Arena, I think it's better to, to, to find a, a, a deal. Uh, the, the effort uh, should be uh, global. Uh, otherwise, of course, we risk just to have data from Europe, uh, the United States, Australia, so just the uh, uh, big countries, but we also need data from uh, other uh, Africa, Asia, uh, South America. So we need to have a simple method that can be easily applied uh, 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 all over the world. Uh, this will allow, of course, to develop concrete recommendations for soil biodiversity, like uh, the creation of a red list for soil organisms to achieve what is the final goal of, uh, um, of this kind of initiative that is protecting soil uh, biodiversity, having specific policy for soil uh, biodiversity. And that's it. Thank you for...
your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. I'm going to introduce our last speaker, um, Dr. Andre Zaitsev, um, who uh, I actually, uh, I know his work from Soil Mites, which I also work with. Um, he is uh, currently holds an appointment at the um, Sobertsov uh, Institute of Ecology and Evolution um, and the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow. Um, Dr. Zaitsev, when you are ready, you have the floor. So thank you very much indeed, I am ready. Do you see the screen? I do, if you could, um, yes. Perfect. Okay, thanks a lot for the excellent introduction. So I am very happy to uh, see all the colleagues and please consider this presentation as some sort of the follow up for the Alberta's one because uh, though indeed we need to study soil biodiversity globally, it's also important not to forget about that actually it is formed locally. So that uh, anyway, the biodiversity is uh, defined by many drivers and we can divide them into ecological and macro geographic ones. So while ecological ones are dependent on the environmental and biotic factors influencing any community, the macro geographic drivers are solely associated with the large scale heat and moisture exchange effects uh, across the planet. So uh, in terms of soil biodiversity, the impact of microbe geographic gradients received some attention over the, the past few decades. Ecological factors are clearly well better studied. The interactions, unfortunately, are still rarely addressed. And moreover, if we talk about diverse uh, disturbances and intensive management, they can really eliminate and level out the effects of the factors that are normally considered to be the leading ones in defining soil biodiversity. So overall, if we talk about different drivers, different factors, uh, the age of them is acting most intensively at a certain scale. And uh, those, uh, this is the concept scheme, how approximately are they arranged if we talk about a community. Uh, further, I will present a few examples, mainly on the mites, but also on some other groups. What uh, comes up uh, if we take into account this scheme? Uh, and the first example is about the uh, large uh, transect we've been studying in Europe, covering both uh, uh, spruce and uh, deciduous forests uh, in seven regions uh, in five countries. And uh, there we started two groups, those were t state amoeba and oribated mites. And uh, surprisingly, for example, the forest type didn't really determine too much of the soil biodiversity level for these two groups. And they were also resembling uh, to each other. What brings us to the question, what are the actual drivers defining uh, the diversity locally? If we don't see some consistent gradients as one would expect uh, when studying uh, transects, and for the T-state amoeba, indeed, uh, throughout uh, this area, the species regions, the total diversity was dependent on the organic layer, while some uh, traits, diversity of some traits of them were defined by the different factors. For the oribetids, it was even more complicated because the overall richness didn't really depend on the macro geography. But then we really could discover the different uh, ecological drivers define diversity of different traits. And this is important to understand that uh, when uh, monitoring the overall diversity, this trait approach can be highly informative and add additional um, uh, explanations to the patterns that we find in space. Uh, uh, if we talk about smaller gradients, then sometimes really strange things can be the leading ones. And we started also rebetted uh, in um, uh, the Netherlands, where there is a clear uh, gradient of the geological age increase coming from the coast to the inland area. And uh, this resulted in the fact that actually the older, the geologically older landscapes we examined, the more species we found. And in fact, this was not really dependent on the soil type 
uh, the, trade, uh, the trend was quite consistent in the sand and clay soils. But at the same time, there was again the very stray, strong contribution of different trades into explaining this. That, for example, the sexually reproducing mites uh, were the ones uh, that actually uh, defined this um, uh, ascending uh, trend in the diversity. So at uh, the more local scale, for example, if we change our forests, if we change a forest type from the mixed forest into a monoculture, we can also lose some uh, part of the diversity simply because the more widely distributed species that are also ecologically uh, more tolerant and more plastic, they seem to prevail. And the uh, species with the smaller ranges, they seem uh, not to benefit from such conditions. While when it is converted back to the uh, mixed forest, the share and the overall diversity of the species that can be called endemic, they also increase. So it's important to understand that this micro mosaic of the habitats can really help increase the diversity at the local scale. Uh, disturbances, they also uh, make their contribution and unfortunately normally the quite negative one into uh, first this explanatory value of different environmental drivers and especially macro geography. This we started along another transect in European Russia uh, where we compared burnt and unburnt forests. And what was quite striking here that uh, actually the effect of fire really reduces the better diversity of uh, mite communities in these forests, meaning that uh, disturbances, especially heavy disturbances, can really strongly equalize uh, the uh, macrogeographic uh, patterns and macrogeographic gradient effects on the diversity of the certain uh, soil taxa. So overall, if we consider all this overimposed set of filters, we can say that each of them has uh, their place in the system, depending on the scale and the scale of the most effective action, as we call it. And at the same time, the degree they can affect the community uh, really changes with the largest effect of the locally acting disturbances and ecological factors that can totally level out the effect of the macrogeographic gradient. So to conclude, we can say that the study of geographic gradients requires appropriate coverage and spatial resolution to avoid unnecessary stochasticity induced by locally acting ecological factors. Ecological drivers may strongly override geographic patterns locally by the order of magnitude. So this is something to be considered very seriously in the future. And the simplification of micro and macro habitat structure and unification of edific parameters after disturbances reduces the effect of macro geographic gradients. Uh, that was it. Thank you very much for attention. I think I made it in terms of time. <laughs> oh my goodness, you totally made it. <laughs> it is it is now two o'clock exactly. Um, thank you so much. We unfortunately are out of time right now. Um, and if you have see questions in the chat, uh, speakers that are for you, please uh, go ahead and answer uh, those. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that we had at our peak this morning, 1900 participants, which is amazing. Um, I am now uh, going to um, turn over to um, Isabel uh, Verbecki, who is going to um, talk about how to get into the parallel sessions this morning. Many thanks, Monica. Um, a few information. First of all, I would like to inform you all that uh, given the few complaints we received yesterday on the absence of interpretation for the yesterday session, FAO has made an effort um, and will ensure interpretation for the tomorrow closing session in both Spanish and French. We sincerely apologize for the Arabic, Chinese and Russian speakers, but uh, it was impossible to find interpreters for those three languages on such a short notice. I will now briefly explain you how to join the parallel session. For the participant who attended yesterday plenary session, you may just skip this intro and join directly uh, your parallel session. 
Well, for the next two hours, we will all split into six different parallel sessions, structure around 90 uh, presentation, well, today about 50, 40, 50 presentation. You can switch uh, between parallel sessions as many times as you like and attend the presentation that interests you the most. Remember that your camera will be on, but you will not be able to unmute yourself. If you want to intervene, raise your question on the chat and the moderator will select some key question and open the discussion. Now, how to enter the parallel session? You can refer to the email that was sent to you recently with the subject attending the symposium. It has a lot of uh, details on how to join uh, those four days. Um, the alternative is also to simply enter the symposium website. Uh, my colleague is now posting the URL on the chat. Let me uh, quickly share my screen. Okay, so you just click uh, here, that's the homepage, join the symposium. Here you can, uh, uh, you just need to click on each image that uh, indicates a different parallel session, type in the right uh, passcode and simply join the parallel session. Um, very quickly also remember that the agenda of parallel session is available here from the homepage. You have a virtual agenda and a downloadable agenda for you. Um, regarding a certificate, we receive a lot of requests also. Um, certificates will be granted upon participation to the four days of the symposium. Just send us a message on the GSOB mailbox so we can check the participation log. Yeah? And, uh, and don't forget to check also the GSOB website. Here under resources, we are uh, gradually uploading all the recording and the presentation. So take a look there. And, um, and that's it. I hope uh, everything was clear and I see you all in the parallel session now. Thank you.